So welcome everybody to this um, public event at the Law School of London School of Economics. Um, I'm Dr. Shiva Tambishetti, and it's my absolute uh, pleasure to welcome you to this event with our very distinguished panel, which I'll introduce um, in just a few minutes. Um, just to be aware, we are recording this session. So if you prefer to keep your cameras off, that's fine. Um, and any questions or interactions uh, we request that you please put that in the chat box and one of us will be keeping an eye on it. Um, so today's event um, is about uh, the sort of earth-shaking um, events of the last few days. Um, as Priti Patnaik, um, report, the tireless reporter of Geneva Health Files just recently reported, um, the ground seemed to give way under the world of trade diplomacy last Friday when the ministerial conference of the WTO was canceled. Um, of course, the TRIPS waiver was not the only serious um, issue that needed to be discussed, but perhaps it was the most salient or urgent one. Um, as countries have rushed in the last few days to impose travel bans, you would be forgiven for thinking that we are ba back in the bad days of April, 2020 except we are not. We now have access to safe vaccines, uh, seemingly plentiful in some areas of the world um, and seemingly uh, very scarce in other areas of the world. Um, this, the question of vaccine inequity um, is one that has become even more urgent in the last 48 hours or so. Um, in fact, uh, the technical lead of the WHO for COVID-19, Marian, Juan Kokoa in an interview said she doesn't understand why more people are not screaming about the outrageous nature of vaccine inequity. It's also a problem with killer statistics, literally and metaphorically. So 2.5% of people in low income countries are fully vaccinated. 8% have only 8% have been given first doses, which compares to 66% in high income countries. Um, vaccine inequity can be described in many different ways. Um, it could, it, it's about uh, people in low and middle income countries being last in line, of pledged doses from COVAX uh, not quite materializing, about supply of vaccines that are close to expiry dates, um, and low and middle income countries having to compete for price and supply with uh, high income countries who have far greater leverage with the suppliers of vaccines. So in this uh, context, um, I'm very happy to invite and have with us Professor Inkube from, uh, who's Professor of Commercial Law at the University of Cape Town. Professor Inkube was going to be at MC12. She was going to attend the ministerial conference as an observer on behalf of NGOs. Um, and was scheduled to speak to us to give us a ground level view of what was happening at the WTO. Um, of course, change circumstances mean that hearing from her is even more urgent. Um, so a very warm welcome, Professor. Um, we're also joined by PhD researcher Marcus Lang. Uh, Marcus has a very unique take on intellectual property uh, as a social scientist, as a sociologist. Um, and Marcus is gonna speak a little bit about uh, the pockets of resistance to the TRIPS waiver that we're seeing at the WTO and give us a sociological explanation perhaps uh, of how that legal position seems to be so entrenched. Um, we're also joined by uh, the law school's own uh, Dr. Luke McDonough. Uh, Luke and I, along with a group of um, co-authors from British and Irish universities, earlier this year made the legal and political case for the TRIPS waiver. Before we pass on um, and ask Professor Inkube and Marcus to speak, I would like Luke to just present um, the case for the TRIPS waiver and what we've seen transpire with respect to the TRIPS waiver in the last six months or so. So the way we will do this is uh, Luke will speak first to give the introduction and then I'll hand over and invite uh, Professor Inkube to speak and Marcus will then speak about the German position. Um, I hope our panelists are going to stick to between 10 and 20 minutes. And I hope that will give us plenty of time to have a robust discussion uh, on the basis 
uh, of what the of the comments that they made, uh, and I'm keen that we keep the discussion to what the chips may, waiver might mean in the change circumstances, so we can make some headway with this very very naughty uh, uh, issue. Uh, so with that introduction, I invite Luke to just give us an introduction, and please be aware again for those who joined us late, uh, we are recording this. Um, and if you have any questions, we request that you put it in the chat box. Thank you very much. Luke, you can take it away. Thank you, Shiva. Um, and may I just say a, a warm welcome, uh, as Shiva said, to, to everybody listening in and also to our panelists. So what is the TRIPS waiver proposal and why does it matter at this particular point, this extraordinary time when we've just uh, detected a new variant and everybody is wondering what impact it will have. Well, the waiver proposal, as initially put forward by India and South Africa, dates to October 2020. And it's worth pointing out that that date is an important one because even that early on, before a single vaccine dose had been administered, while the trial data was still being analyzed, the Global South knew at that point that they would be left behind. Um, when it came to prioritizing distribution of vaccines. And so the impulse and the goal of uh, all of this is of course to create generic production of vaccines and other COVID treatments and diagnostics in the Global South, in places like India and South Africa and Brazil. It is not an end in itself, the waiver. It's a way of achieving that end goal. And it's worth remembering that in relation to the HIV AIDS pandemic, it wasn't donations that resolved and, and brought that under control. It was generic production of HIV AIDS drugs. So the goal of generic production of medicines with, with respect to COVID-19 is absolutely crucial. It's also important to understand that the waiver is, is of international obligations. It doesn't actually affect national IP rights, at least in the immediate term. And there's been a kind of exaggeration from the point of view of, of representatives of the pharma companies who've suggested that it will uh, obliterate um, the, the economic model of pharma or, or that it would um, in some ways uh, abolish IP rights. And that is actually not true. What it would do would be to essentially free up um, individual national jurisdictions to decide what their IP policy should be at this time. It's very likely that um, most of the countries who would make use of the waiver are the ones in the global south, given that especially right now the high income countries have vaccines in abundance. So there may be some minor elements of, of legal change required to national law in the global north, perhaps to share data, to share know-how, to share um, authorization data from agencies and so on with producers in the global south but it's unlikely that it would require wholesale changes to let's say uk patent law in fact there are some uk sorry there are some us academics like amy kapinski who argue that the us already has authority un under the defense protection act to share know-how with for example the who's mrna hub in south africa so the goal of the waiver is actually a modest one. It's to free up and uh, make it possible for states in the global south to um, essentially make use of uh, a different intellectual property policy, one that better suits this particular emergency time. And in respect to creating mRNA, sorry, with respect to creating generic vaccines, the mRNA vaccines uh, are the best candidate. I'm sure many of you on the call have read the piece by Stephanie Nolan in the New York Times. We know from that piece that was very well and authoritatively researched that there are at least 10 sites in the global south in places like South Africa and India and Brazil where the uh, vaccines, the mRNA vaccines can be made within a matter of months if technology is shared. They're the quickest to produce, they're the closest to small scale um, production in terms of medicines, and they're also very, very effective. So it is a good idea that those are the ones that are obviously of focus here. There's also some interesting um, information that has leaked with respect to the mRNA vaccines. The US NGO Public Citizen has published uh, 
some part of the Pfizer recipe that ended up in a contract that was made available online. So that is already out there. Just last week, Pfizer um, accused one of their employees of trade secret violation when it turned out that an employee had uploaded a huge amount of data relate relating to the vaccine production processes to a Google Doc. So it is quite likely that aspects of the mRNA processes will leak. And thus, even if there isn't governmental sharing, there may be enough information in the public sphere that allows a low and middle income producer to make the vaccine and to uh, share it with other um, countries in the global south should we get a TRIPS waiver. So the idea that the waiver is um, you know, not going to be of any use is simply untrue. Um, and we certainly will not know that unless we try. And I'll finish with this one point. We have seen in the last month two licenses granted to the medicines patent pool by Merck and by Pfizer with respect to COVID-19 pills but not vaccines. And interestingly, it has been reported that even though Pfizer has licensed generic production of the COVID-19 pill to several Global South countries and thus their producers, Pfizer still expects to make 15 to 25 billion on that pill from sales to the rich countries. And if we look at where Moderna and Pfizer have made their money, again, it is from sales to the rich countries. So the idea that generic production in the global south will destroy the economic model of pharmaceutical companies and destroy their incentives is simply an untenable one. So I will uh, shift now uh, to our very esteemed guest, um, Professor Nkube, who is going to give us a, well, what can only be described, I guess, as a, a, a surprise and a shock report from what it feels like right now in South Africa. Thank you very much. Look, I'm just trying to get my stuff set up um, to start my presentation. Um, okay, so it's taken over my whole screen. Uh, I hope that you can see my screen and hear me. We can, yes, yeah, all no good. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I am pleased um, to be here um, and to contribute to this really important um, conversation today. So I went through a whole range um, of emotions as I prepared, um, you know, my thoughts, what to speak about, how to pitch it, where to start, where to go, where to end. And um, it's really, I think the word for me is, is a somber. Um, it's a really somber moment um, to be joining you uh, and speaking to you about this from South Africa, um, from the global South generally, where we are confronted with um, this vicious cycle of uh, inequity. Uh, we are the heart of the global crisis, um, so to speak. And you know, the data keeps changing and the images keep changing. And so I, I screenshot this um, earlier today and I'm sure uh, things might've changed, but I just wanted to start here and to say a few things. Um, so we're confronted by inequity. We are the heart of a global crisis. Um, a lot of our discussions tend to be extreme. Um, they're extreme to the extent that I hear a lot of amplification of the South's inadequacies of hesitancy, um, whilst there is gross minimization of the supply issues that actually blight the South. Um, whilst often we don't speak enough about the hoarding and the waste of, vaccine that is, of vaccines that is going on, um, it is a tragedy that orders are not fulfilled or they're unconsciously delayed. Um, this whole skewed supply scene that we're witnessing, that the whirlwind that we're in actually perpetuates this vicious cycle. And uh, it would be everybody's sincere wish and desire, I'm sure, that would get out of it. And I think that the answer actually is equity, not charity. So I'm very grateful that both Shiva and Luke um, have made the legal case for the TRIPS waiver. And so I don't have to do that again. Um, but, you know, headlines often jump out at one. Um, and so these are just three that jump, well, four that jump out at me uh, whenever I think about this. Um, the tragedy of not getting um, supplies of vaccines that have been committed um, that just don't arrive. 
simultaneously or at all. Um, the factors look uh, has pointed out that there are facilities and capabilities to actually start manufacturing. Um, and just today, a few hours ago, actually a friend sent me um, a link um, to a story saying that um, a license had been granted by Johnson & Johnson um, to South Africa to start actually manufacturing. So, so much is going on. Um, but I just wanted to, to kind of highlight those headlines and say that with all that that is going on, um, the TRIPS waiver remains imperative. Um, it is one clear way out of um, these dust straits that we're in. And so because I'm not going to repeat uh, the legal case for the waiver itself, I really just wanted to say that for me, one of the prime areas to, to look to would be the human rights aspects of it. And so um, there's been a lot of communication, written communication um, from uh, six independent uh, UN experts to the G7, to the G20, to the EU, to the World Trade Organization. And, and I just wanted to say that if you haven't had sight of these um, that they're really important reading to get hold of and to just digest um, to see the, the human rights case as it is being made. And so there's just a list of um, three sources here, but you are probably very familiar with Shiva and Luke and others um, piece on the, the TRIPS waiver, but perhaps some of you had not yet seen um, the human rights um, writing on this. And so I was just going to suggest that you look at the International Commission of Jurists Expert Legal Opinion, um, and that, of course, that you have sight of those letters that are referred to. Um, but time doesn't permit me to go through all of those um, human rights arguments. And so really, the only thing I want to say is that we, we have got to balance the rights of every person to access without discrimination, a COVID-19 vaccine that is safe, effective, and timely, uh, so that everybody actually can benefit um, from scientific progress. And that can only be achieved if people actually fulfill their responsibilities, the collective state responsibility, individual state responsibility, and indeed even a private sector responsibility to try and back and break the back of this crisis. So um, all that being, you know, trying to get to my main points this evening. So I would say that there are six points of action um, that are very clear in my mind. This is just the way it, it occurs to me, it looks to me. Um, and so we've had about the waiver proposal. We know MC12 was supposed to happen last week. Um, you've heard a bit about how I was um, going to travel there as part of a civil society delegation. Um, to observe. And then, of course, um, it all fell apart, of course, uh, when Omicron um, came to the fore, when scientists uh, in South Africa shared um, their discovery and triggered all of these travel bans and ultimately the cancellation of MC12 itself. Um, the TRIPS waiver and the solution to this crisis remains imperative. We actually do need to do something. And so I want to spend the rest of my 10 or so minutes talking about the four points, four, five, and six, which is where I think we are and where we ought to go. So it would be for me that the WTO needs to do something. Uh, it's facing its own crisis of legitimacy at this point. It needs to do something. Uh, we did, well, most of us were watching yesterday the World Health Assembly, and we know that they are very um, promising moves there to come up with a legal instrument um, to assist in, you know, with future pandemics. But the timeline for that is, is long. Negotiations will only start next year in earnest, and the earliest we're likely to see any kind of legal instrument is 2024. Meanwhile, 5 million people and counting have died. And so we actually do need to do something. Um, so that's the WTO for me. Um, that's national action. I'm going to talk a bit about what the global south itself can do. And again, Luke has spoken about um, what would be required um, from the global north and he's made it very clear that minimal um, legislative reform will be required. A lot of the work needs to be done by the South itself. And I've got some ideas about that. And finally, I think that the South in trying to meet these challenges actually does need to cooperate and, and come with some kind of regional approach. For example, um, in the African Union, we know there's an African continental free trade agreement that's been agreed and there are intellectual property negotiations going on. And so there's a lot of scope there at that level um, to do certain things. But let me then finally get to talking about this moment that we're in since Friday. Um, today would have been day one of MC12. 
Um, it's not happening today. Um, we've explained why. Um, I just wanted to then share my thoughts on what I thought would have transpired this week um, had MC12 actually occurred um, and what I think the possible pathways might have been. So as Shiva has already said, there were multiple issues on the table. So there were a myriad of texts um, that the trade ministers and negotiation teams had to look at. And so the waiver was one amongst a lot of issues that uh, confronted um, trade negotiators. That in itself um, often presents a problem uh, for the Global South. Um, it strains resources, it strains the negotiating teams to have so many issues on the table. It actually stretches resources. Um, to add to all of that, there are very divergent views on what the way forward should be. And there's very heavy contestation for space. Um, this contestation is for physical space. I'll tell you what I mean by that. And also for cognitive um, space. So the cognitive aspect is really clear. It's this battle of ideas about what should be done, what can be done, what ought to be done, right? Um, but a little bit on the physical. So having planned to go as part of um, a civil society organization delegation, um, they, I'm sure some of you would have picked up in the press or other reports um, that uh, initially CSOs um, had been granted a particular number of badges um, because of space constraints, because of the pandemic, um, those badges were reduced. And so there was a lot of unhappiness about that, the reduction of actual physical access uh, by CSO representatives because the badges were then um, reduced, the number available. Secondly, uh, it was then uh, announced that there would no longer be a physical space um, in the MC. 12th um, actual physical um, uh, forum. There, there wouldn't be space at the WTO headquarters because you know there isn't enough space. And so the space for CSOs would be somewhere else at a distance. That of course, again, uh, raised a lot of concern about now uh, there is a distance between um, the stakeholders who do want to be there to negotiate, um, to observe negotiations and to do what they can. Now, you know, the space, the, the distance uh, caused uh, some issues. Um, in the end, this, this all fell away because in the end, nobody was able to go. But those were interesting things that uh, consumed a lot of us uh, going forward and preparing for MC12. So had it happened then, what might possibly have happened? Well, obviously there was going to be intense negotiation and lobbying, it's been going on for two years. Um, the outcome of that could be that, you know, there'd be a stalemate, there'd be no agreement on the waiver and, you know, we, you know the delegation would leave NC12 with nothing. Um, being optimistic, I was hoping that um, the intense negotiation and lobbying would actually lead to some compromise, to some text um, that would get us moving. So those were just my kind of predictions, expectations going there. Um, and then I just wanted to, to kind of maybe dig a bit deeper into some of these things that I've just said. So I, I made the point that there was a lot on the table. Uh, there still is a lot on the table, right? So these are some of the documents if you visit um, MC12's um, website, um, these were the documents that the delegations would have had to, to engage with, to digest, to negotiate. So quite a lot of them, as you can see, um, there would be reports by negotiating group chairs. Um, you will see here TNIP30, that would have been a special session of the Council for Trips that, that wasn't about um, the waiver, that was about uh, GI protection. Um, the waiver came up, um, in the annual report of um, the TRIPS Council, uh, the document IPC 92. Um, that is a kind of longish document, six pages or so. Um, if you go through it, you will see that they talk about the TRIPS waiver proposal in paragraph 27. Um, and it's just to say that they're keeping the lines of communication open. Um, and they were just looking to see if an agreement could be reached at MC12. And if so, if they could possibly call a meeting very quickly. Um, other things were kept on the agenda. The EU proposal was on the agenda. Of course, as we all know, none of this materialized. And what has since happened is that yesterday um, there was a, a formal meeting of uh, the Council for Trips. It's their last regular meeting on their schedule that they had yesterday. Um, reports coming out of that meeting uh, that they have decided that they will continue consultations on the proposal by both South Africa and India, the TRIPS waiver proposal and also the competing uh, proposal by the EU. 
um, reports seem to indicate that um, there might be a meeting of the Council for TRIPS um, in December on the 10th or 16th, possibly even earlier. So what one might gather from that is that work is still being done um, and that uh, the details are of course not, not quite clear, but they seem to be uh, promising to the extent that meetings will continue and that people hopefully are keeping open minds. And so I just want to go back then to my six items or six points of action and say those four things that I think that we should now be concentrating on, or at least what I'm pinning my hopes on, um, speaking from where I am um, metaphorically and physically. Right. So um, the WTO, of course, has got two choices. Uh, they can continue business as usual. Um, I wouldn't advise that. Um, I think that the changed circumstances that we find ourselves in actually call for urgency, uh, for actual action to be taken, you know, for the sake of the, the, the globe, and of course, you know, uh, for the organization itself, it is in a crisis of legitimacy in my eyes, and I'm sure in the eyes of many of us and the global south. Um, even as that continues, whatever is going to happen with the TRIPS waiver negotiations, um, I often come across interesting discussions and people say, okay, that's well and good, but what are you doing in the meantime whilst you're waiting for the waiver? In other words, with or without the waiver, what are you going to do for yourselves? Um, the answer would be partially that um, legislative reforms need to be enacted, those that are obviously uh, important and pending. So, for example, South Africa has been uh, considering patent uh, law reform for a number of years, close to a decade now. Um, and I think that those patent law reforms actually are imperative. They must be uh, you know, uh, legislated as soon as possible. And this can happen now. We don't have to wait um, for the waiver. Um, I've got a slide later on talking about what I think needs to happen if the waiver passes. So I'll leave the with the waiver part. Um, of course, um, capacity and logistical info, uh, capacity is always a problem. Manufacturing and logistical capacity is often raised. But I think it was yesterday, look, that you actually shared on Twitter, again, a story about how um, this is complex for all. This is not a problem of the global south. Uh, this is a problem that confronts all states. And I think the story that you shared uh, was about Germany. You'll correct me when you get a chance to speak. And so um, logistics are a big problem. For example, in South Africa, where there was a very slow initial rollout of vaccines, and then all of a sudden there was a flood. Um, then, you know, systems that have been put in place to roll out um, vaccines actually do need to respond. And so that's complex. Um, we should accept that. And we should also accept that countries will adjust and will get the logistics in place. In the meantime, I would say to states, uh, it would be important to start thinking about these things, um, enhancing capacity, making sure that your systems are flexible and resilient enough um, to move uh, as required. And I would think that cooperation would be necessary both for manufacturing capacity and even for distribution logistics. And so this is something that uh, the Global South can start to think about and start to plan um, on their own. Um, and so that's really the, the collective action from a, a practical perspective. There is also collective action from a policy uh, perspective. And this is where I was thinking about um, the IP protocol of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, uh, because um, th that I hope is going to be a high level policy guidance kind of document. And then states in that document can start to commit to certain common positions that would assist them uh, with this particular pandemic and future crisis. So for example, if countries were to agree at that high level policy plane, that they would adopt regional exhaustion, which of course they can, because Article 6 of TRIPS allows them to take whichever um, principle of exhaustion that they want. So if they adopted a regional exhaustion principle that would assist um, in actually getting vaccines mobilized across the region. So those are the kinds of things that can start to be done at the moment. And then I want to go back to that question. I said national action with and without the waiver. And I've spoken a bit about national action without the, wa the waiver or pending the waiver. But what if the waiver passes? What if we actually do get our, you know, our, our desire, our wish for which we've made this very strong legal and moral case? Um, if that passes, what then should happen? Well, we, this is not, this wouldn't be the first TRIPS waiver, right? So uh, TRIPS waiver has been passed before. Uh, we're very critical of it. It's not a very good solution, but we've been down this path before. We know what needs to happen after a waiver 
passes. And so we would simply have to do the same thing again. Um, there would be national legislative reforms. And I've just got a screen grab of what Norway did in 2004 following the 2003 waiver decision. Um, so you pass the legislation that you need to pass in your domestic plane. You notify the WTO as is expected and required by the TRIPS agreement, and then you implement the laws. Um, so that's what needs to happen when the waiver passes. And then of course, I've already said that um, capacity and logistics need to be taken care of. And so those were really kind of my thoughts um, that came to mind when I was thinking about this very particular, this very important moment that we're in, um, what would have been MC12 um, in Geneva. Uh, which has failed, but of course, we'll still continue with seeking the solution to this crisis. And I think I will stop here. I'm very keen to hear what Marcus has to say, and of course, what people um, in this virtual room have to, to say as well. So we'll have a good discussion after. Thank you, Shiva and Luke. Thank you very much, Caroline. Um, there are many questions uh, that we can come back to. And as you say, let's go to Marcus now, uh, and we'll, we'll have a discussion afterwards. Marcus, over to you. Yeah, what I want, want to discuss are the three main arguments against the waiver that you hear from US and EU vaccine manufacturers in recent week and recent months. And I have three arguments basically that I found. So I call it the incentives argument, the uncertainty argument and the production capacity argument. And the incentive argument is basically that vaccine manufacturers are only incentivized to invest in future vaccines if you maintain international IP protection. But the problem with this argument is that additional in incentives associated with selling vaccines in middle and low income countries were really not necessary to create the vaccines we currently have. The pandemic was what economists like to call a natural experiment. And this experiment tested whether the incentives of selling vaccines only in large markets so like the United States, like the European Union, were sufficient to create them. And they clearly were. I mean, this is why we even talk about vaccine inequity in the first place. So if you earn 36 billion this year, 29 billion next year, like Pfizer, just by focusing on high and middle income countries, you have basically settled the incentive question yourself. Economists like Salad, Susanna Scotchman argued decades ago that incentives to sell patented goods in large markets can be sufficient to develop them. And the pandemic proved that. And what this means is that incentives arguments really lack economic justification today. We can't make these arguments anymore. Then the second argument against the waiver is that it creates uncertainty for vaccine manufacturers because it gives, according to Pfizer's chief patent counsel, unfettered digression to the companies that wants to impose it. So what he and the EU Commission seem to prefer instead is compulsory licensing under TRIPS. Why? Basically because under TRIPS, companies that want to impose compulsory licensing have to provide a justification for doing so. But it is really not clear why we, why we would need a case-by-case -case justification to reduce uncertainty for companies. Under the German Epidemic Protection Act, for instance, the German parliament, the Bundestag, can declare an academic situation of national importance. So if a country declares an epidemic situation of national importance, you have a justification for a waiver right there, basically. You don't need to go from company to company because you have a national declaration. And this would be much clearer than the overcomplicated compulsory licensing system specified in articles 31 and 31 BIS TRIPS. Then the third argument against the waiver is that, it's, that it is generally too difficult to get manufacturing plants up and running. So even if you get plants in middle and low income countries in the way described by Stephanie Nolan in her New York Times article, you still won't get the suppliers. The chief patent counsel of Pfizer claims that Pfizer has supplier sites around the world in at least 19 countries and has 86 supply agreements with different companies. 
And while this might be true, this doesn't mean that a waiver can still increase economies of scale, particularly if not framed in the narrow way as it's currently framed in the EU proposal. So for instance, if you waive provisions relevant to manufacturing know-how and regulatory data, Article 39 trips, then you increase economies of scale, which is clearly much better than the status quo. And it's, it is finally not really clear to me why the EU would think that it could legally secure the compensation of vaccine manufacturers after, uh, after IP rights have been waived, why it thinks this would be the right way to go. We are mostly talking about countries which are not only in the middle of a pandemic, but also in the middle or right before a public debt crisis. So the right thing to do would be to give these countries discretion in setting compensation, in saying what's paid after um, a, a TRIPS waiver came into force. So countries should be able to decide how they compensate companies. And if the EU actually believes that increasing the compensation for Pfizer, BioNTech, Moderna, and so on could help to end the pandemic, it should by all means use the IMF to channel money earmarked for the compensation of companies to middle and low income countries. It can do that without kind of um, um, undermining the disc discretion of uh, middle and low income countries. I think we don't get an impact for waiver without some kind of compromise. And I think this is the area where a compromise is most reasonable. With, with respect to other issues, we maybe shouldn't compromise. So Pfizer has an IP department with, with 130 IP professionals spread out over the entire globe that knows how to flexibly apply for and enforce patents in different parts of the world. So this doesn't make it likely that case by case compulsory licensing approach, if the trips ever amounts to this, will actually achieve particularly much. And it also makes it likely that a waiver that only focuses on patents will short of uh, will fall, fall short of expectations. And a waiver would have to be broader than this. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Marcus. That was very succinct and um, very expertly done to sort of categorize the arguments that we see against the TRIPS um, waiver. Um, I'm just gonna try and pin myself if I can. Perhaps Luke can do that for me. Um, so I have, I have a range of questions um, I'd like to raise. Um, Caroline, perhaps I can start with you and uh, sort of taking off on a point that Marcus okay. just made about, um, you know, the, that there are things that Germany can do right now that we don't have to wait for the waiver. And also your sort of analysis where you look at what we can do now without the TRIPS waiver and what we can do post TRIPS waiver. Nice. So my question to you uh, would be, um, given that there are things that governments in high income countries can do currently. So Marcus has given us an example. Um, Canada, for instance, could put COVID-19 in its schedule of the Access to Medicines Act. It hasn't done so. Um, so to these countries and with respect to these countries, do you think the TRIPS waiver will actually have that impact of making them sit up and realize that this is something that has to be done? So if they have not done it now, when there clearly is a crisis, why do we think that they would do it uh, with the TRIPS waiver? Because the TRIPS waiver, as, as Luke was saying, is not immediate, right? It has to still go through the national legislative process. So what might change with the TRIPS waiver? So I'm not sure that what might change would be the, the actual, um, legal text but what i think might change by that i mean i don't think that they would act differently because of the actual legal text because it, it would not what we're asking them to do now does not need them to wait for the legal text um, of the trips waiver to be adopted uh, but what i 
think what I hope might happen would be that if the waiver is ultimately passed, um, that the forceful um, moral and legal imperative behind it, I'm hoping that that is what gets countries to act because they should be acting now, as you rightfully say, there's nothing stopping them. Um, so I'm just hoping that the, the impact and the momentum um, and the gravity of the passage of the waiver itself will actually get some movement, hopefully. I'm an yeah. optimist. <laughs> uh, Luke, do, do you want to come in on that question? Do you think uh, the imperative changes with the TRIPS waiver such that these countries that have not acted so far will be compelled to act? Well, we have certainly seen some positive effects from, for example, the US support for a waiver back in May. Um, you know, the waiver was, was really being ignored even in, in the media before that. And so US tacit support for a waiver, even if not the India-South Africa proposal, has already borne a lot of fruit. Um, there's no way that we would have had the, the, the BioNTech BioVac uh, agreement from July of 2021 without the waiver, because when BioNTech and Pfizer agreed that with BioVac, they explicitly said, we're doing this because we don't want to see a waiver. So, you know, the threat of the waiver it, you know, we have this idea in patent law of a groundless threat and that that's a bad thing. Well, the waiver is not a groundless threat. It is entirely grounded in inequity and in the reality of that. And it makes sense that companies are afraid of losing rights under the international IP system. Um, and in some ways that threat has prompted action. I mean, as Caroline said, even today, we saw a new agreement between Aspen and Johnson and Johnson that the head of the WTO has been um, kind of putting forward. It is just for a fill and finish deal. It's not full manufacturing, unlike, for example, what Serum Institute of India are doing with regards to the AstraZeneca vaccine. But that is positive. And I would imagine that if a waiver actually passed, it would give countries cover internationally and diplomatically to do more than they have done now. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have a question uh, in the chat box and, and that kind of coalesces um, with a thought that um, I've been meaning to articulate as Caroline was speaking and perhaps I could do that um, and ask um, all three of you to, to come in on that. So when we give, um, you know, we have said in, in our paper, for instance, that the TRIPS waiver is both an incentive and a mandate, that there's a carrot and stick approach. So what that is predicated on is that you have a sort of marketplace where these kinds of leverage can work in a contained space. Now, given that the market is global, we don't, we lose out on that sort of leverage. So if, you know, the, the threat of a compulsory license in a particular territory, for instance, doesn't have the same impact it might otherwise have. So the question um, is, you know, the question in the chat box was about the threat of the waiver versus the waiver itself. I think the threat of the waiver exists and has not had the impact that we would have liked to see. Um, I'd like the three of you perhaps to comment on how do you think the markets would react to a waiver? So I see a waiver as primarily directed towards uh, market dynamics that uh, a waiver would give incentive to, for close competitors to get into the field, to play the long game and enter into the field. Uh, it might allow for more foreign direct investment uh, because there is now freedom to operate. Um, so we would see um, with the waiver, a more conventional dynamic play out uh, because it's now possible to operate in the field. And that of course is about productive capacity. It's about uh, the ability to take legal risk. Marcus just pointed out that Pfizer has all these lawyers and therefore, uh, you know, a case by case approach is not going to work. So in terms of the market dynamics of what we might see happen post waiver, what are the sorts of relationships or networks that can really help us um, sort of springboard from the waiver in terms of the market? I hope I've articulated that clearly enough. Um, I, I think I can jump uh, onto that. I mean, it, it's very difficult to say because I mean, the patent landscape is very foggy right now. So we don't know yeah. actually who has patented what, where. I mean, you, you have 
applications by Pfizer BioNTech, so joint application that assign pretty much the whole world as designated states, but we don't know where they actually want to go. So something one could see in the case of a successful trip waiver is that it speeds up the kind of normal strategizing of companies that they move faster into countries that they abandon things faster so when the fog clears so to speak and you see the actual patents you will see kind of the competitive landscape probably how they see it at this particular point in time and if you think from a kind of civil society perspective, what to do about that, then kind of a first important step is to kind of get the landscape right, get an idea, see it to a certain extent how they are seeing it. So you can adjust everything you do in the case of a successful waiver or also an unsuccessful waiver to the strategy they think they will roll out over the whole globe to speak. So for instance, you have, the wonderful patent pool work um, on the patent data that's available right now, but this is already lagging. So this is kind of the first applications. So what you see in there are priority applications. This, this is not really representative of what those company, companies are actually planning to do. And I think it will be important to, uh, to figure out what kind of the global strategies of those companies are. And I think it would be helpful if we would have um, patent offices in middle and low income countries who build more independent search capacities. We have many uh, Asian states who build independent uh, search capacities and were e economically, strategically, legally successful because of that. I think we also need kind of search capacity that supports civil society projects like the waiver. Yeah, thank you. Um, Caroline, I wonder if you might want to comment on that question. Are there allies, are there transnational networks that can spring into action post the TRIPS waiver, if it comes? Yes, I, I think that they are. Um, and as Marcus was speaking, I was just thinking about, um, I think we might see improved market behavior. Um, there have been some and happy trends, uh, committing and not delivering um, the terms of contracts. Many have been exposed to be grossly unfair. Uh, we've had instances where even where you have the fill and finish uh, contractual arrangements um, that we learned later on, for example, that in South Africa, those that had been filled and finished in South Africa actually were shipped from South Africa to go somewhere else when there was that need in South Africa. And I'm thinking that the passage of the waiver uh, is probably going to rein in some of this market misbehavior, as I call it, because um, if this continues, as you say, the, the networks of um, other friendlier market forces will, will take over. And besides, we might then not need to really rely on your patent protected um, vaccines because the waiver is in place. Would you so mind you, if, I, if I said something very yeah, quickly, please. Ashima? Um, so, I was presenting this recently to a group of scholars and at one point I got a question which was almost kind of saying to me, um, isn't this a bit anti-market, you know? And I hadn't really been expecting that question to be honest with you, but on reflection, what I should have said and what I'm gonna say from now on and what I'm gonna say this evening is that actually no, what I, what I want to do and what I think we all want to do on, on this particular call is to create a market for generic uh, vaccines. And so this is very, very far from being an anti-market approach. And yesterday in the House of Commons, Caroline Lucas asked uh, Sajid Javid uh, about the TRIPS waiver and the UK's lack of support for, for the waiver. And you know, it's well known that he's a big fan of Ayn Rand and that he's a bit of a libertarian, but it's very unfortunate that he reads Ayn Rand and not Friedrich Hayek um, because Hayek was very skeptical of intellectual property rights precisely because he believed in the market and he felt that uh, intellectual property rights in certain scenarios could create anti-market behavior and unhelpful monopolies in certain situations. And you know, given that we're in an unprecedented emergency and we're now seeing the unfortunate effects of not having vaccine equity, of not putting into place generic production uh, a year ago when this was first suggested, um, 
we, we really do need to revisit that question about whether the best way to, to operate is to have a market that, as, as Marcus very eloquently put it, operates at the high income level through state incentives in, in this situation, and then essentially involves donating the leftovers, you know, scraps from the table of the rich countries to the low income countries and to some lower and middle income countries where, you know, that one month they get no vaccines, the next month they get a million, and of course they can't absorb them. So, you know, it, it doesn't make sense, even if you think about it from the point of view of some of the neoliberal econom economists like, like I am. But, but if you make this argument that what they do is actually, what we are trying to create a market is that what we see is perfectly um, acceptable under kind of socialism state steering because it's an allocation shortage problems. You don't know where things are supposed to go in the market. So you, so you have a hoarding of, of vaccine, you have shortages in particular countries. That's precisely what happens if you don't have a market. This is problems of a socialist economy. And this is what you see paradoxically. So we have all those people who are talking about the market and how important property rights are as part of the market. While these are the classical problems that you can see in the Soviet Union in the 1960s, 1970s. Fantastic point. So Marcus, I'm looking forward to reading a paper by you titled Socialism and the COVID-19 Vaccine Market. Uh, fantastic, fantastic thought there. Um, I'm going to come back, Caroline, to this question. Um, and, and please, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm holding the time here because I'm incredibly, you know, in a privileged position here, but please put your questions in the chat box and, and I will keep track of it. But I want to engage um, Caroline in this, uh, in this idea of the perceived legitimacy of the WTO. Um, so you've already given us a glimpse of how difficult it is for low and middle income countries to some extent to come to Geneva and have parallel teams, to have the capacity to have parallel teams engaged in these highly technical and highly contentious issues at the same time uh, when they're also dealing with a raging pandemic uh, back home. Uh, there's that question. And then there is the question of if the WTO cannot swing into action in, in these circumstances, then what, what does that tell us about the legitimacy of an international agreement uh, that binds its members um, to behave in certain ways, but does not give them the help they need uh, when circumstances are, are dire. So my question, I suppose, is if you looked into the next 10 years, where do you see the WTO? Where do you see the TRIPS agreement um, with respect to uh, legitimacy and the global south? I mean, I... I think definitely that um, if nothing happens soon, um, that uh, the WTO is going to lose um, its credibility, its standing, it's going to lose its trust um, amongst the global south because um, it would be that in a moment of dire need when we needed the organization to swing into action and be decisive, um, that it failed to do so. And so, you know, countries would remain bound by the TRIPS agreement. Um, but I think that um, there would be this huge trust deficit and that we are likely to see um, countries going off to do it you know, somewhere else by themselves. I think I read a piece yesterday about if um, you know, the WTO fails to act decisively and come through this time around, um, it's likely that the Global South will find other platforms to further their cause. Um, I think we'll have another round of forum shifting and I think rightfully so. Thank you. Uh, and you've all already raised the very important question of human rights obligations. And clearly, you know, the WTO is not something the WTO can directly address, and yet uh, it is increasingly occupying uh, countries in the global south. Um, Luke and Marcus, do you, do you have any thoughts? Yes. On so to, just yeah. to, to, to very quickly answer one of the questions that came up in the chat there for, for, from Nat, who's one of our students here at LSE, um, it's possible that the threat of the waiver um, could have further positive effects, um, but we, we, you know, it's very hard to predict. And you know, we, I think we have outlined that. You know, we all think that the waiver uh, 
should pass and that we hope that it does. And we think that that would also have positive effects. So we just have to wait and see. Um, but on that, I also wanted to ask a question, uh, um, given that we've just talked about the context of the WTO and the TRIPS agreement more generally, because one of the first conversations I had with Marcus over Twitter was about you know, the, the kind of the good cop, bad cop relationship between BioNTech and Pfizer, where you know, in Germany, which is a very, very pro-patent state, you know, it might actually be the most pro-patent country in the world. That's what that's the headquarters of the European Patent Office. Um, its SMEs in Germany are, they patent in higher numbers really than any other European country. So there's this kind of sense that patenting is, is a really good thing in Germany, that it's, it, it supports the SME sector. And now we have BioNTech, which is uh, the biggest SME success story, surely, in Germany for, for this, certainly this century so far. So um, I wanted Marcus to, 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 to give us his thoughts about that relationship from a German perspective point of view, um, because I know when I spoke to you before, you said that a lot of the Germans were kind of not really paying attention to Pfizer and its 130 lawyers around the world and were focused very much on little BioNTech as the kind of success story here. Yeah, I mean, the German general public, as the public in most countries don't understand that something like international patent protection exists and, and doesn't understand the importance of global supply chains. So that's certainly a part of, of it. I think that the dynamics um, in Germany and in the United States, on the other hand, are really interesting, where in the US you can't mention that BioNTech has something to do with that, while in the in in Germany, on the other hand, you have to ignore that Pfizer, this huge international company, um, has something to do with that, and, and and I think they 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 play kind of this double role, as you say. So the typical the German media who would be onto this thing, so what BioNTech would do in different parts uh, of, of the world can't do that because people aren't interested in Pfizer, so you can't make this connection and they successfully established kind of a story that's really only this entrepreneurial success story of Biontech. So it really seems uh, on the media side um, seems to have worked out for these two companies. Thank and, you. But, but it's kind of, it, it diverges from the typical models of small German SMEs in, in so far that it really has to establish um, a certain degree of international manufacturing capacity. While if you're your average German SME, what you do is you, you have an invention, you patent it worldwide and you try to license it in a particular country. While this in, in this instance isn't possible. So you need actually a supply at work, you need even something like patent enforcement would be difficult for a BioNTech to do at this size. So it, it, it needs uh, a BioNTech for all of these things. And this is also, I think there's a, there's a question in, in, in the chat for me, do you think that vaccine inequality is a problem rooted in capitalism? Um, it's not really that much a problem of capitalism. It's really the relationship between capitalism and the state. So Pfizer brings a lot of expertise in interacting with governments uh, uh, in the whole world, so to speak, not just with, with regard to patent question, but with regards to, to other uh, questions that are important for contracts, as establishing manufacturing uh, and so on. Uh, as well. And in this, um, it's a very useful partner for BioNTech, but BioNTech is also a useful partner for Pfizer. Thank you, Marcus. And, and look, that was a really good prompt. And if I may say here with respect to capitalism, I think what we've seen is a, is a ceding of power to private uh, interests. That's really extraordinary, you know, when if, if uh, these companies can put in clauses to say that um, you know, we will do, we will behave in such a manner so long as the pandemic is ongoing, then in effect, governments cede the power to say when the pandemic ends uh, to these companies. And I think, I think that sort of power is really extraordinary. We saw the Mod Moderna declaration that the EU can now um, donate uh, Moderna vaccines to COVAX, um, for instance, and as Caroline has mentioned, the sort of contractual misbehavior uh, 
that we've seen in these countries, I think is extraordinary. So, I mean, it's a big question, but I would, I would hold that thought with respect to dysfunctions of capitalism and this growing power of private interests uh, being really remarkable in, in, in this, in this yeah. period. If, if I can just say something quickly, Shiva, on, on Moderna, since you, you, you've raised yeah. that, that, that really important point, which is that, um, so Moderna put out a PR statement and they put out a, a, a tweet, I think it was beginning of last week or, or the, just the week before, essentially with pride saying European countries are now allowed to donate their Moderna doses to uh, COVAX. And it was not known before they tweeted this that European states were banned under contract with Moderna from doing that, that they weren't allowed to donate. And so, you know, it, it was one of these um, incredible moments that, that, that we've, where we've seen uh, a kind of, of admittance of harm, which is kind of dressed up as if it is a wonderful thing. Um, and I'm thinking here as well about Pfizer's advertisement full page in the New York Times, where they say, you know, vac vaccine equity is our northern star and all, all of this kind of kind of uh, stuff that they had applied for a trademark on. Um, but the other thing that was quite extraordinary, I think this links as maybe to Graham's uh, question, um, which is that in the, the, the Q3 uh, shareholder statement from Moderna, and this could apply to, to, to Pfizer and BioNTech as well. But it happened to be that they, again, very openly put in that statement a slide, which, again, revealed what they really think is going to happen next year. And this is before Omicron. Um, that slide, which is, again, in the, in public, in the public sphere now, uh, says explicitly they expect the high-income countries to become uh, endemic. Uh, with regard to COVID, but the, the, the lower middle income countries outside of the OECD will remain in a pandemic state for, um, uh, for, for, for the foreseeable future. And so, um, including all the way through 2022 into 2023. So, the, you know, those public statements that we have seen have been incredibly revealing on the, on the point of view of, of, of Moderna. Um, but Graham's question, just, just to flag it up for the other panelists who may want, want to talk about, and particularly, you'll be very interested to know what Caroline's view is here, um, is that, you know, whether it is by accident or design or, or simply the flawed nature of the system, what has happened is that um, Africa and other continents, other countries that have a very low vaccination rate because deliveries have only just started arriving this month, they have now essentially become incubators for mutations of the virus. And so, you know, we don't yet know where this virus um, first, uh, uh, this, sorry, this, this variant first arose. Um, but for you, Caroline, I mean, what does it feel like in, in South Africa and, in, on, and on the continent of Africa? Does it feel as if you have been left in that way where essentially the virus can run rampant, even if that results in dangerous new variants for the rest of the world, include as well as, as yourselves? So uh, personally, I mean, that's, that's exactly how I feel. Um, it's, it's, it's really difficult to get one's head around. Right? So I think of the stories that I read um, last year uh, when all of these vaccine trials were happening in South Africa and you know we were cooperating with the rest of the world contributing to finding a solution um, and, and, and that seemed to be exciting and then from a personal perspective um, later on um, when supply seemed to be strangled to South Africa and the rest of the continent I started to get very concerned and, and you know you really feel left behind and almost used um, in a sense. You're good enough for the trials. Um, you're good enough for your scientists to, to isolate these new variants and share with the world, but you're actually not good enough to get the vaccine. You've got to wait until 2023. And this, I'm just speaking for myself. That's how I feel. Uh, powerful words there. Um, so, uh, Perhaps I could turn this into a question about intellectual property law scholarship. You know, the, the sort of the rawness of what you just expressed there, um, Caroline, I, is something that Luke and I and, and my co-authors, Graeme certainly here, that we really, um, you know, faced up to. We've looked this in the eye and we wondered, what does this mean for intellectual property law scholarship? Um, my question perhaps to all three of you is, do you feel that academics, 
the scholarship? Um, have we generated the right kind of ideas? Um, is this a crisis of credibility of what we do as intellectual property law scholars? It's, it's almost as if uh, the fellow feeling, the suffering of others is seen as very remote from in the way intellectual property law impacts on people. Uh, and it just seems quite difficult to square this with some pockets uh, of academics. So I, I just wondered, Caroline, as, as a Global South academic, how have you um, perceived um, the response from um, IP scholars? Um, I'm not too sure um, what to say to that, but I, I, I felt that um, the scholarship for me has felt very contested, very personal. Um, and unlike most of the scholarship that I've done before, um, there, was a, there was some distance, uh, but this is very real up close and personal, right? Um, and, and so when I read some scholarship from some of our colleagues across the world, I, I, I see a lack of empathy, I, I see uh, a lack of urgency, a lack of appreciation of the very real life and death circumstances for a majority of the world. And so uh, from that perspective, I think perhaps um, our scholarship has lost the plot, but I'm also very careful to, to realize and always keep front and center that of course, um, it's we're in the grip of this pandemic and it's very upfront and personal, but also, of course, we still have to be doing scholarship. But I think our scholarship needs to be empathetic. Uh, it needs to matter. It needs to mean something. And um, surprisingly, this is why I came into intellectual property law, right? So I started out as a commercial lawyer, did corporate governance, corporate finance, and none of that meant anything to me because, you know, making sure some company is rich this doesn't get me, it's not important to me. Um, intellectual property, on the other hand, actually spoke to me because there are all of these access imperatives. And, and this is why I think this is a really important area of law um, to be working in. And I think we need to do so with empathy, with human rights front and center. Then we will do scholarship a real service. Thank you. Luke, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um... We, I mean, certainly when, when Shiva and I and Graham and Ashling, who are both here and, and, and our other colleague, Hyo, who, who, is, who is not on the, on the call, um, decided to write the, the, the paper back in May of this year. Um, we did so in, in part in response to the fact that, you know, we were, we were kind of saying, where are all the, the pieces about the TRIPS waiver? Because the, po the proposal had been made in October 2020. And we were just really surprised that there was so, so little had been written on it up to that point, um, number one. And also what had been written tended to be quite critical and not only critical, you know, criti criticism is absolutely fine, but to my mind and my reading dismissive actually of, of the idea. And uh, I felt very much dismissive of the Global South's concerns. And, you know, those three points that Marcus outlined were, were front and center that, oh, the waiver will destroy incentives. Um, and also these countries simply cannot do it. That was a constant um, constant refrain in uh, some comments made by quite senior IP scholars who will remain nameless, uh, that, you know, uh, uh, that countries in the global south simply couldn't produce these vaccines. And so it, it was important to us to, 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 to respond to that um, and to give what we felt was a more kind of holistic view of, of the topic. Um, I think at the back of our minds, um, we hoped that we were wrong about some of the, 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 the kind of the, the points that we made in back in May 2020, uh, sorry, May 2021, I should say, um, or, or May of this year. Um, I think we hoped that when the pharma industry and some IP commentators said, you know, chill out guys, you're worrying over nothing. By the end of the year, we'll have 11 billion doses. That's more than enough to cover every adult. Everything will be fine. Um, we kind of hoped that that would be true and that uh, you know, we would be proven wrong in, in, in that uh, the waiver would, would in the end not be necessary. Um, so so I, I, I'm, I'm very, um, I have entirely mixed feelings about the fact that you know, when we read back over that piece now from May 2021, um, a lot of it still rings true, too much of it, to be honest. And uh, it is 
I mean, it was so predictable that this would happen. Um, and, you know, I, I, I certainly can't imagine what it is like to be in Caroline's position, to be an academic working in this area in the global south. Um, when, you know, the, the reason for this waiver proposal was that South Africa and India and the, the other 60 or so countries that have co-sponsored it, they knew that, that they would be, they would be de deprioritized by the system. They knew that donations through COVAX wouldn't work as, you know, at the beginning of 2020, you know, we were told 2 billion doses, no problem, COVAX is, you know, it, it, it hasn't worked out the way that um, it was assumed that it would by the backers of that scheme. Um, and donations certainly have a role. They had a role in the HIV AIDS crisis, but they cannot be an entire solution. And um, now here we are at the end of, of 2021. Uh, there's a report from Airfinity today, which says that if uh, the, the, the variant, and let's hope this is not the case, but if the variant does evade the current vaccines, then all of the, the, the facilities currently making vaccines will have to be repurposed for new production. And the best we can hope for is 6 billion doses of new vaccines uh, by October 2022 spread between Moderna, Pfizer, BioNTech, AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson. So, um, you know, that is very scary because um, if this variant turns out to be the worst possible scenario, and again, let's hope that doesn't happen, you know, it's going to be round two of, of vaccine hoarding, failures to vaccinate the global south. Um, and so, you know, we may be triggering another cycle of, of, of the same behaviors and the same problems. And we certainly don't want that. So, you know, what I would say to, and, and you know, I, I spoke at the, 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 the CEPA conference this week for Life Sciences, the Chartered Institute of Patent Attorneys, and I actually had some great conversations there. And I think there's a growing sense, even from those who six months ago thought, there's no need to do anything about this because we'll have 11 billion doses by the end of the year. I think there's a, there's a growing sense amongst the medical community, even amongst patent attorneys, um, that we do need uh, to, to make a, a serious effort to create generic vaccine production in the global south. And that, that is the pathway out of this because the producers and the countries in the global south know best how to deal with their own um, state capacities and so um, you know when you have to go out as the south african government has to do to various communities different linguistic communities and so on to talk to them about the need for vaccination and so on that's much easier for the south african government to do when they can plan when they have a steady list of orders coming in rather than as caroline said a flood of, of orders coming in without much notice. Um, so it, it makes sense, I think, to, to, to think about it that way. Um, and I think that there is more support than there was six months ago, more generally uh, in the public and also amongst specialists, like in the medical community for, for a waiver. Thank you, Luke. Um, I, I perceive part of the, you know, the sort of issues around academia and scholarship as a communicative challenge. Uh, you know, we've seen um, arguments related to the TRIPS waiver uh, designated emotional responses, uh, making that sort of sort of delinking it from a rational composed response to a complex problem. Um, to that, I would say to be emotional is to be human. Uh, and to be emotional does not mean you're not rational. Um, so the conversation and the communication has had to go down to those kinds of level. And I, I do hope that this period is a period of sort of pragmatic revival in IP scholarship that takes us on to um, directions that we perhaps have not ventured into so far or have ventured into too little. I, I, that's, not, that's not a question uh, for uh, the three of you. Um, I'm aware that we don't have any questions from the audience. So with my privilege as chair, I am going to pose a question to the three of you. Uh, and I'd like to just end with your responses to that. Um, so my question is to the three of you is, what would you like to see in the next one week and in the next three months? So perhaps um, Marcus, I can start with you. So in, in the next uh, week, I would hope that there's a concrete plan how kind of an 
negotiations that were discontinued now are going to continue, that there's kind of, you get an agenda how things are supposed to happen in the next couple of weeks and in, in the next months. I hope there is some trips where they were coupled to some kind of, uh, some, to some kind of financial program on the international level that makes it an actual um, working impact for the waiver. And if this doesn't happen, and if we get a waiver that looks like exactly like the version that the European Union has suggested that we don't get this waiver because this waiver um, could kind of stifle the movement, I think. Thank you, Luke. I am going to say something a bit cheeky and say that I hope that uh, what we see is in the next week, a leak of a lot of this information. Um, because as we know, under, tra under trade secrets, um, it is very difficult to put the genie back in the bottle once it's out there. And I think that the fact that there are already partial leaks happening with respect to the mRNA vaccines, is a positive thing. There's an economist called Dean Baker who's been calling for the US to actually waive NDA protections with respect to um, life-saving uh, vaccines in this context. So um, I'm hopeful that um, so, uh, something will happen in, in, in the, the leak hacking field that uh, produces information because uh, we have uh, obviously, the mRNA hub in South Africa that the WHO has sponsored at Afrigen. Uh, there was a great piece about them in the Washington Post yesterday. In that piece, they, they essentially say that if they got enough information, either voluntarily from Moderna, I, that would be the ideal, but it doesn't look like it's going to happen. So we're looking for a non-ideal situation. But if they got the information, they could manufacture the Moderna vaccine within a year. Um, doing it through reverse engineering will take three years. So um, we want to speed this up as much as possible. Um, it will happen eventually, but uh, that, that's certainly the, the immediate goal. In terms of three months, I hope that um, the negotiators use that wisely. And, you know, it's been interesting to see as an IP lawyer, some, the way some of the international trade lawyers and scholars have approached this, because they have much less sympathy, it seems, with the idea of the waiver. And they're very much of the view that um, you know, this, this is all horse trading and that South Africa and India have to give up some of the things in the waiver. The EU will have to, will have to um, give up some of its red lines. The US might broker in between. Uh, I would like to see an effective text get into, uh, in, 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 into the, the law. Um, I think a bad text will not do us much good. Um, and it's better in a way to keep the threat of uh, a really effective text uh, continuing than accept a text that might save the WTO and save face at the WTO, but would actually do nothing. And, and I, I completely agree with, with, with Marcus, it has to be an international collaboration with uh, bodies like the IMF, the World Bank, um, to help finance some of these generic companies if that is necessary, if they don't get immediate foreign direct investment from, from financial um, companies. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Great, thank you. Caroline, the last word. Okay, I'm gonna plus one both of them and say that I, you know, my wish would be for immediate action in the next week. WTO General Council, convene a meeting, get on this, pass the waiver. Really, that's what we need. Not a compromise, an effective text. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. So if I can repeat that, pass the text in the next week uh, and the WTO needs to act. It's imperative that they act uh, not within weeks, but within days. Um, I'm, I'm aware, Caroline, that it's much later where you are. Um, so I, with deep, deep appreciation for your time, for coming here uh, and speaking to us. Um, thank you, Professor Nkube, uh, Marcus, uh, and Luke for, for all your um, work on this. And to our audience who stayed, uh, you know, the, through, you know we've, we've made Zoom a part of our lives now. Uh, thank you so much for being with us and for participating in this discussion. Thank you. <laughs>